Hi, everybody. This is Mr. Folly, and welcome to Podcast 8.2. Hopefully, I'm audible. My throat's killing me, so don't get the swine from me going, ah, but I don't think that'll happen. Uh, quick review of ionic and covalent bonds. Hybridization, which is brand new, you've never seen before. Sigmund Pi, brand new, you've never seen before. Bond length and bond strength is pretty straightforward, so hopefully we can get through this before Yahoo cuts me off. Ionic bonds. Electrons are traded. This means there's a huge EN is electronegativity difference. Why? The reason why is one atom attracts the electrons, and the other one um, has a weak hold. So a weak hold and being very attractive means that they're going to run away from you. So if you have a weak hold on your girlfriend and someone very attractive comes along, then you don't have a girlfriend anymore. Um, ionic bonds are between a metal and a non-metal. Um, they form a lattice, so a Lewis structure would be dumb. Remember, a Lewis structure, uh, our lattice structure has um, repeating structures like a cube stacked on a cube, stacked on a cube. Yeah, I can't draw more than one cube. So Lewis structures would be dumb, which we've been working on a ton. Um, the bonds are the strongest, so they have the highest melting point and boiling point, and they form ions in solution. So when they dissolve, they form ions, not molecules. Strengths of ionic bonds are based on Coulomb's law, which is this equation right here. So there's a constant. Q is charge 1. Q is charge 2. And R is radius, which is listed right here. Charge is way more important than radius. A big energy would mean that it's the lowest energy. So if it's got a strong bond, that means a lot of energy is released. So it is a very weak one. So why are the bonds negative? Because bonds are forming... So which bond is the strongest, strongest, MgCl2 or MgF2? So you're looking at magnesium and chlorine, and you're looking at magnesium and fluorine. Um, magnesiums are the same size, so I'm going to get rid of that. And the charges are the same. Both of them are plus 2, minus 1, plus 2, minus 1. And so now I'm looking at chlorine and fluorine. So fluorine is smaller Right? It's, close, it's higher up. Chlorine is bigger because it has more energy levels. So looking at this, if chlorine is big, that means the bigger it is, the smaller the energy. So which one's going to be stronger? Fluorine is stronger. Chlorine is sad. So which one's stronger? MgF2. CaCl2 or KCl. Using the Q1, Q2 over R squared. Remember, charges matter a ton more. Um, calcium is plus 2. 2 times 1 is 2 over R squared, whatever that is. Um, KCl would be 1 times 1 over R squared. So clearly, 2 times 1 is greater than 1 times 1. All right. So if nuclei repel because they have positive ions in them, so they're positive while they have as protons, why would a bond form? Um, as they get closer and closer and closer, all right, let's start out where they're far away. And so far away, they don't really have an attraction. Um, their electron clouds will overlap eventually. So as you get over here, the electron clouds might even repel a little bit. But as they overlap and the bond forms, you get a happy bond distance. So there's a balance between the um, attraction of the overlapping electrons and um, the nuclei. As you get closer and closer, the nuclei are so close they repel each other. A distance where energy, sorry, is the lowest is the bond length. So another same thing but a different visualization, very far apart. Um, so they're so far apart they don't really interact. Um, H atom and H atom where they're close enough they begin to interact. Notice there's a little bit of overlap here. And then the molecule where you can't even tell where the electrons are. Now this looks like there's three bajillion electrons on here. There's not. This would be like a picture being exposed over and over and over again and seeing where the electrons are. So at some point, these electrons are also attracted to this nucleus and vice versa. So. Covalent bonds, electrons are shared. However, they are rarely shared equally. So they're almost never shared equally unless they're sharing with themselves. Okay. Um, and it's determined by the electronegativity. So if they're unevenly shared, um, they're called nonpolar. I'm sorry, if they're evenly shared, they're nonpolar. Polar means ended. Okay. So the North Pole 
south pole, north end of the world, south end of the world. If you're bipolar, you're really, really happy and then really, really sad. So unevenly shared is polar. Not really shared is ionic. Um, and this is an agreed upon scale. Basically, a bunch of scientists decided we need to have these arbitrary lines of good and bad. So decide how tall is tall. So in my opinion, um, a guy has to be 6'2 to be tall. In Peggy's opinion, she's tall. Um, here are some different, this is the table of electronegativity and these number values are usually given to you. You need to have memorized C to H is nonpolar. I know C to H mathematically is 0.4, but you shouldn't have to look up C to H as 0.4 is nonpolar. You need to have memorized C to H is nonpolar. So you can see Mac Daddy of electronegativity, eh, Francia. Bond polarity versus molecular polarity. Bond polarity is the electronegativity difference of two atoms. Now, molecules can have more than two atoms. So if I have NH3, that would be four. So I could be looking at a specific N to H bond, and that would be bond polarity. But if I was looking at molecular polarity, I would have to look at the three-dimensional shape to determine the polarity. Okay. Um, and molecular polarity is the sum of all polarities. Sometimes polarities cancel out, so sometimes they don't. So first I'll have CO2. C, double bond O, double bond O. Hopefully we've done enough Lewis dot structures that that makes sense. Okay, so polarity. C to O is a polar bond because if I look at my little table over here, carbon is 2.5 and O is 3.5. So the electro, the negativity difference, oops, the electronegativity difference is um, 1, which is polar. Right. Again, my scale is 0 to 0.4 is nonpolar, 0 0.5 to 2 is polar, and 2.1 and above is ionic. And it's just a scale that goes through, through the whole thing, so it's a gradient. So here, um, the way you can indicate polarity is draw a arrow pointing at the negative side. So oxygen has a bigger electronegativity value, so it's more negative. So, and then the carbon is more positive. So for this one bond, carbon is the positive end and oxygen is the negative end. So if you remember to do, um, you point an arrow at the negative side. So in class, let's say Allison is good. Right, here's Allison sitting here and she's good. Hi. Say hi, Marianne. Hi. Say hi. Hi. Okay, say I'm glad I'm not a turkey. I'm glad I'm not a turkey. Good, okay. So Allison is over here and she's good. And Kevin is over here. And he, of course, is evil. We'll give him that, guys. So whenever Kevin does something bad, Allison, being the good person she is, points and says, Mr. Folly, Kevin's being bad, and points at the negative side. So the arrow points to the negative side, and the carbon thing goes to the positive side. Same thing is true for the other bond from one side to the other. Now, the center of positivity is clearly right here, right? Center of negativity is either on the right or on the left, or it averages out to be smack dab in the middle. Okay. Now, if I'm looking at NH3, which I have drawn in 3D shape over here, um, it is a polar bond, so we'd have to look at that. And nitrogen is the bad part. Ooh, there's the negative part. So nitrogen's more negative. It's closer to fluorine, blah, blah, blah. So the center of negativity is clearly right here on the bond. Center of positivity, I've got three of these different things in a pyramid shape. And if I average those three together, it's right here on the bottom, and I say that's tickling the belly. That means I have a negative, a center of negativity on top of the N, and a center of positivity on the bottom, tickling the belly. General rules, no pairs, nonpolar, and that's only if the outer atoms are identical. So if I have X, A, 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 that's going to be nonpolar. But I have X, A, A, made this a B, woo, then that's a bad one. And then that would be polar. Um, example, if you assume polar bonds, square, planar. So if I have X, square, planar, if you look at your sheet, hopefully you're better at drawing the things, but or identifying the shapes. We've been doing it a lot in class, I hope. Got two pairs here. This has pairs. You'd expect it to be polar, but hopefully you can see that this A would cancel with this A, and that 
top right A would cancel the bottom right A. So those vectors of positivity or negati negativity would cancel out, and it would be gone. Trigonal bipyramidal, X, A, dash, dash, dash. And if you look at your structure, they draw them probably better than I do. This should have been a wedge, sorry, and A. I think everybody can probably see that top and bottom will cancel out. Hopefully you can see that this A and this A will average out to be in the middle between these two, which would then cancel out with this guy right here to land smack dab in the middle and all the vectors cancel. Trigonal planar, A, 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 and trigonal planar. Um, these two A's would cancel out to be right here, and this one, the vector would cancel. Right, hybridization. Hybridization is super easy. The explanation is a little bit difficult, though. Um, when I had four bonds, so like if I have CH4, it has four bonds. And on those four bonds, um, carbon has four single electrons. One, two, three, four. And all of those form bonds. And so if I have four single electrons, I have four bonds, but every C to H bond is identical. So what happens is these hybridize. So instead of having a high energy P and a low energy S, they blend in the middle, and it's called an SP3. Notice one S orbital and three P orbitals would make it S1P3. And then the, when it bonds, you would have the four electrons from carbon, and then the four electrons from the four different hydrogens. Okay, So when that blends, it goes through it. Now, hybridization AP chemistry is a dream. I absolutely love it. Each superscript counts as a region of negativity, which would mean it's a lone pair or a, or a bond, or I guess and a bond. So lone pairs and bonds. So anything that has two regions of negativity is SP. Any, so if I have CO, which looks like that, that would be SP hybridized. If I have SP2, um, then it has three regions, and it is based on trigonal planar. So anything that has a trigonal planar um, electron pair geometry is SP2. Anything that has a tetrahedral electron pair geometry is SP3. Anything that has a trigonal bipyramidal has five regions, one plus three plus one is five, is sp3. Anything with an octahedral electron pair geometry is sp3d2. So let's do these quickly. So I've got NO2. N, one, two, three, four, five, O, O. One, two, single electron, single electron, single electron, pair, pair, single. Connect the dots. Ooh. Okay, now what happens here is this moves up, this moves up, and this one is stuck. So this is the evil of all evil ones. This is the Kevin in that situation again, only he's not negatively charged and has Allison pointing at him. So we have NO2. Remember, the only thing that will ever break the octet rule is the central atom. So for this, what you're going to have is N like this with a single electron, and this right here, which will have... Um, oops, I almost double bonded that without, if I double bonded this, mm, let me see here, one, two, four, I still need a lone pair there, don't I? Two, four, six, seven, no, that's right. And then these other guys are okay. So the central atom breaks the thing which you don't like. This has, this is one region, two regions, three regions of electronegativity. It would be SP2 hybridized, and its shape would be bent. Right, this electron will push it down. H2O, you know, looks like Mickey Mouse. You better. Okay, two pairs. It has bond one, bond two, pair one, pair two, four regions. S, one, P, three. Don't show the one. So pi bonds. Super easy. Sigma is a single bond. Pi is the double part and or the triple part. N2 is triple bonded. I'm trying to make sure I make it under the 15-minute thing, so I don't know if I can make it. So this would have one sigma, and it would have two pi's. Whoops. Two pi's. Pi, pi. Okay. CO2. 
would have how many sigmas and how many pi's? Well, everything's got a sigma bond. So this first one, I'll call this bottom one sigma, this bottom one sigma, top one pi, top one pi. So two pi, mm, pumpkin pie. Two sigma, I have nothing to say about that. Stronger bonds are shorter. Um, Coulomb's law helps explain this. Stick example. If I want to break a stick over my knee, I should have made my stick brown. That's okay. I'll make it black. If I want to break it over my knee, a big stick is easy to break over my knee. Now, if I have a little stick and I change colors myself, when I smash that on my knee, what will happen is because there's not much room there, I'll just hit my knee and hurt my knee and say a dirty expletive like, oh, Brazil, which I still think we should take over to get the Olympics back. Review. Coulomb's Law helps determine the strength of ionic compounds only. Only ionic compounds. So don't try to use it for the other ones. Polarity deals with bonds and molecules. So molecular polarity has two things. It has to do with bond polarity and it has to do with shape. And that's how you determine molecular polarity. Polar bonds can cancel. Hybridization is just adding superscripts to each region of negativity. Sigma single. Pi is double triple. Oh, and I have the wrong thing on here. And I forgot what I was doing with this. This was an old one. Um, I forgot what that is completely. All right. I'll have to look at the old podcast. Have a good one, and happy almost turkey day. Bye.